Hey, everyone. Just wanted to make a quick, timely announcement. And admittedly, it won't affect all of you, but for those that will, it's important. New guidance has been issued from the SBA, which is the U.S. Small Business Administration, about the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. For those of you that are applying for this stimulus money, uh, this is very important. And although we did not get it into the show just because we got it much later, uh, we wanted to to get it out to you as quickly as possible. So we've included the voicemail from Sean Mullaney, the Phi Tax Guy, at the ve- at, after the end of the episode, after the bumper. If you need that information, just wanted to let you know that it's there. Make sure you stay tuned for that. And um, yeah, we'll try to keep you updated as best we can. Hope that helps. All right, everyone, I got an email recently from an individual saying, hey, guys, uh, I appreciate that you are 100 percent equities and I understand your logic for that. But I am actually going to be approaching drawdown relatively soon. And I feel and I want, you know, I want to have some bonds in my portfolio. Uh, What bonds would you recommend? To which my reply was, I am uniquely unqualified to make a recommendation or answer that question with any significant authority. The one thought might be that you should just own them all, right? You're just trying to smooth the ride, just own them all. You could get Vanguard's total bond fund. Uh, the ticker is BND. That would be one approach. And I could we could even go take a look at how the BND fund has performed with this uh, Black Swan event that we're kind of going through with this pandemic that we're experiencing. And it was a little bit volatile at the beginning, and it looks like it's kind of smoothing out. And if your goal was just to smooth the ride and you had a 60-40 allocation of stocks and bonds, you certainly would have had a uh, smoother ride than someone that was 100% equities. But I don't really feel super confident in that answer because there's no real sense of why behind it. When we say I'm 100% stocks, you own a, a piece of every publicly traded company in the United States, which is about 3,000 some odd companies if you own like a VTSAX fund. What does it mean that you own a total bond fund? What do those bonds represent? And what is the role of fixed income in a portfolio beyond just smoothing the ride? And so what I thought we could do is, I have long planned on having a segment called Ask Frank. Well, why Ask Frank, do you say? And this is because Frank is super active in our Facebook group. He's an attorney, which you would think would make him uniquely unqualified to speak to bonds, much like I'm a pharmacist. Brad's an accountant, so slightly more viable. But to be honest with you, Frank is probably one of the more active people in the Facebook group. And when I see him comment or post, I usually find myself saving his answers. And I find that his answers to various really great questions stand the test of time. What I mean by that is I look back at those answers, you know, a year later and I'm like, yeah, that was a really good answer. That was, that was, I'm I'm impressed. And so I've just kind of categorized and come up with a list of them. And one of the places that I think he can really add some significant weight to this conversation is in the role of fixed income. So Frank's an attorney. He went through the 2008 downturn and kind of reevaluated his bond plan. And now here we are a decade later and the changes that he made based on what he discovered in 2008 kind of led him to make some decisions ahead of time. And now he's kind of saying, all right, here's how it worked. I thought we could bring him back on the show and kind of have him go through his mentality and how he looks at bonds. And one of the great things I've heard him say is, well, what are you wanting to get out of bonds? What do you want? Do you want stability? Do you want diversity? What is it? This is a fascinating conversation and help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. And yeah, as you described, Frank is one of the true pillars of the Choose a Pie community. He's been a member of this community, an active member since 2017 when we started. And I find that his answers, his thoughts, they're just so well-reasoned. He's extremely thoughtful and he's just a person, like you said, every time I see him mention something in the Choose of I Facebook group, I stop and I read it because I know it's going to add value to my life. And I love that concept of the Ask Frank segment. I think we can do that moving forward. And like you said, neither of us are experts on bonds by any means. And it's going to be really interesting to just talk through this, talk through the underpinning, the intellectual underpinning of why Frank invests in bonds and how the community can consider this as well. So Frank, with that, welcome to Choose a Fine. Thank you so much. And you're, you're quite generous. I'm, I'm not just a lawyer. I was an engineer in a former life before that. So, so it, does, it does help when we get to the numbers and thinking about things like that, which is more of a hobby these days than a profession. I wasn't sure where you, where, where you wanted to start. I can talk about you know my experience in 2008 and, and what I learned from that and, and then where I went from there. But uh, will, would that yeah. be helpful? Yeah, I think okay, it would. So, so going back to 2008, you know, I had a mix of, of, of things and I was reading all sorts of, of recommendations and things like that. And I, I, 
I read a book called Spend to the End, I think, uh, by an economist. And, and he was saying, well, you really should put most of your bonds in tips, uh, treasury, inflation protected securities. And so that's what I did. And lo and behold, we go th- through 2008 and I'm thinking, this will be great. These will do well when the stocks are doing badly and then I can rebalance. And then I looked and saw what my tips did and they went down too. Um, they didn't go down as much as the stock market, but they went down. And I was like, well, that that wasn't what I um, was hoping to get out of this. And it made me scratch my head and say, well, what are these bonds? Are there bonds that, that actually do like go up when the stock market goes down? And what is in these bond funds that, that makes that happen or not? And I started reading all sorts of things. I read about permanent portfolios. I read uh, Ray Dalio's papers, all sorts of things about how combining different asset classes. And one of the things that came out of those uh, research was that really the world of bonds is extremely varied. And it goes from things that are a lot like stocks and perform a lot like stocks to things that are completely the opposite, that generally go up and sometimes substantially when the stock market goes down. And so looking at that, then I started thinking about, well, what are the different purposes of these kinds of bonds? And it ultimately, after you know mulling this over and thinking about it for a long time, there are really three purposes, I think, that you have for bonds in your portfolio. One is stability, something that's not going to move very much when your other things are in chaos. Another one is income, that you actually want to draw income off of these things. And then the third one is diversification. And when I say diversification here, I mean specifically having something that goes up when your stocks are going down or is negatively correlated with your stocks or your other holdings. So this is great, Frank. And I want to kind of talk about, you know, your original thesis was tested and didn't do what you wanted to do. So you iterated based on your research in current times. And we'll come back to that in a second. But before we even do that, A stock versus a bond. When you own a stock, you own a piece, probably a very small piece of ownership of a company, a publicly traded company. Contrast that with what what is a bond? What are we talking about here? A bond is a a, a debt instrument. So you owe the right for somebody to pay you. So if a company issues a bond, you own a right for the company to pay you for that bond. If your bond is from the government, you have a right that the government will pay you. And since I'm a lawyer, I can tell you that that right is actually protected by the 14th Amendment. Um, If it's a a federal government bond. But a bond is basically a right to be paid. A bond has a tenor or a length. When somebody says it's a 30-year bond, that means you would hold it for 30 years and you'd get paid the interest rate for 30 years. And so bonds go from what you call T-bills or commercial paper, which are just month-long instruments, all the way out to these, these 30-year bonds. And, and there's talk of issuing 50- or 100-year bonds these days because interest rates are so low, but I, I don't think we need to go there. So, Frank, with these, uh, let's say, bonds through private companies, you are, in essence, as I understand it, you're loaning money to this company, right? And then there's this contract, this bond contract, for them to pay you interest and then I assume pay back the principal at the end of of that time period. So I guess first, I'd love to hear if if that's accurate. And second, does an individual investor who has five or 10 or even $20,000, like how do they get invested in one of those bonds? Are they too small? Do they go through a company like Vanguard or Schwab or Fidelity? Like how does someone invest in an individual bond if that's even advisable? The easiest way for somebody to invest in an individual bond would be to go to Treasury Direct and you can just buy a bond from the government from there. I think for most people, though, it's much more convenient to do it through funds that already hold these bonds. And most of the bond investing that listeners and people think about are through that mechanism, through a bond fund, which may hold one kind of bond or may hold a variety of kinds of bonds. So let's just take the Vanguard total bond fund. Um, and I'm looking at the, the ETF ticker is BND. I always forget the um, mutual fund ticker, but they're, they're the same. If you take the lid off that and see what's in it, you'll see there are 50% treasury bonds that are issued by the federal government. There are 28% corporate bonds. 
and they're they're what are called high grade corporate bonds. So they're issued by companies like Apple and the largest companies you can think of, the ones that are in the Dow, the biggest ones, the most stable companies. They're not fly by night companies. And then there's 22% of the bonds and there are government mortgage bonds, Ginny Mays. Those are the bonds used to back mortgages that are backed by the federal government. And so that that is a sort of a wide variety of bonds in there. What, what you don't see in there, you don't see any municipal bonds in there. And you don't see any what they call junk bonds or low grade corporate bonds in there. So that's a kind of a large, stable group of bonds. Another factor or, or important thing to think about is what is the duration of these bonds? How long or short term are they? In the total bond fund, you'll find that 36 percent of the bonds are what they call long term bonds. They're 10 years or more in tenor. 39% are intermediate term bonds. It's between five and 10 year length bonds, and then 25% are short term. Now, each of those kinds of bonds also has different performance characteristics, and we can get into those as we go, because we can start talking about what if you have different kinds of bond funds that actually are just specialized in, in one or more groups of these things. And you'll see they perform extremely differently, particularly in these kind of challenging environments that we're in. And we can get into that, but uh, I think I may have veered a little bit off. No, that, your that, no, 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 that's, that's very helpful. And, and yeah, just to be clear to the audience, we are not advocating this particular bond fund as something we recommend. We're just saying, using this as an example. But I guess my, my question is, what is someone looking for? Like quick hit, there are hundreds, probably many thousands of different bond funds. Like what would you look for first? Like, is it as simple as, okay, this is a total bond market index fund. I look at what's the return, which is in essence, the interest. Does any other component go into the return other than, I guess, the interest on these? Are there sales embedded in them? Are they maturing? Like, how does that work? I guess like- Yeah, what there are two components of return that you'll get out of bonds. One is the interest that is paid, but the other can be capital appreciation or depreciation. They can go up or down in value. And that occurs over time with fluctuating interest rates. Generally, when the interest rates fall, the capital value of your bonds rises. So in an interest rate falling environment, the value itself, the bond is not worth, it's worth 100, 110. Uh, so does you that can make, sell it. Is that, the, the is that common sense? Like, does that, does it make sense why when the interest rate falls, your bonds would be worth more? I mean, why, why does that, why does that happen from an economic perspective? Because the bonds have a fixed interest rate written on them. And so when the interest rate in the market goes below that, the, the value of the bond goes up basically so it matches the market. Um, it's hard to explain. Right. That's for a pre-existing bond. That's that's the crucial portion, right? right? Is so that pre-existing bond has a higher interest rate than the prevailing rate in the market now. So people are willing to pay a slight premium for it. Is that is that a pretty good summation? That's right. Or, or maybe a very large premium. Right. For it. Fair. Very fair. Yeah. And, and when you're talking about bond funds, these bonds are holding pre-existing bonds. Um, so you're not buying a, a, a new issuance of them. So a total bond market index fund, again, in this case, we're just using Vanguard as an example. That's not similar to how we think of a total stock market index fund, which holds thousands of companies and they can add, they add more like this total bond market index fund doesn't truly have every bond in existence, right? It's, Cor it's that it's, it has a, a broad swath of bonds that might correct. cover the bond. In that case, it has a broad swath of high quality bonds, but Vanguard itself decided this is going to be the mix for this fund. And since the bond world is so much more varied than the stock world, um, really each bond fund, you probably want to look inside it to see what's actually there, particularly if it's advertising itself as a total bond fund or some, some large aggregate, something or other, before you go into something like that, you'd want to look and, and see what the description of it and, and take the hood off and look at what it says. Because uh, these things at any brokerage, I went to Fidelity to find out what was in the total bond fund for Vanguard. It's just there and you can uh, get this information very easily. But um, it's what you want to do, particularly if you're going to go into more 
specialized bonds with different characteristics. You know, I have a strong bias for simplicity uh, with everything I do. Just my brain can only ha- handle so much. So my perfect world, like my 60, 40, you know, allocation would look something like, you know, 60% VTI total stock market. And then 40% would be just a total bond fund done two funds. It's over. And so if you were going to test that thesis out, you know, like, all right, well, bonds are there to smooth the ride. So I don't have to endure hundred percent, you know, all the volatility that hundred percent stocks would look like. And then we take a look at what happened in this, on this current market, 2020, March, 2020, you would think that, okay, as the stock market goes down, the bonds, my index bond fund would kind of tow the line or hold the line. And it's, it's kind of done. It hasn't done exactly that. In fact, there was a little, fair amount of volatility, even in bonds, which, you know, with the, about a month of hindsight, it all smoothed out. Everybody's happy, I guess, as long as you didn't panic when you saw your bonds go down, but it did, they plummeted the total bond fund plummeted right alongside the stock market in early March. And it recovered a lot faster, but I'm interested to hear your perspective on why that happened. And then if that's almost too much simplicity and you're looking for a tool that you understand how it's going to react to stock market volatility, kind of what you're doing now. Yeah. So the reason that bond fund would have declined in particular is because of the corporates that were in it. Corporate bonds tend to follow the stock market a lot more, whereas treasuries tend to go the opposite way of the stock market. So that bond fund has both of them in it. Um, And and so we'll have both of those characteristics. The other characteristic that's important in how much something moves is the duration. So when you have longer term bond funds, they're more volatile, they move up and down more. When you have very short term bond funds, those are very stable, they're like cash, they're like savings. They don't move a lot in either direction. And so since this bond fund BND has some corporates has a variety of durations. It's not surprising that it moved around a little bit. Overall this year, it's it's up 3.46%. Uh, and I, I'm talking about the capital appreciation, not, not the interest that it's being paid. And if you look at how it's correlated to the stock market, it has about a zero correlation. So it, it doesn't move necessarily opposite to the stock market. It doesn't move with the stock market. It just kind of sits there. So that is a a good example of a bond fund that you're mainly holding it for stability. Um, You're not expecting a lot of diversification out out of it. It's just uh, going to be stable because it holds all of these different sorts of things. So BND in this case, the total stock, in this case, specifically, we're looking at what BND did during the coronavirus in the the fall and early March with a little bit, with a little bit of volatility for the first week or two, it held the line. It, it's smooth and, that, the ride. That, and that's that's typical and that's pretty much what you would expect out of that a, a fund that holds those that kind of mix of, of bonds in it. Now, Frank, you in 2008 were primarily in treasuries. You, you know, got a lesson out of that. You did all the research. You're willing to embrace a little bit more complexity than just a two fund strategy here. And I'm just curious, how did you what was the scenario you wanted to create for yourself if another, you know, 2008 like black swan event were to occur? What were you wanting to see happen? What was the new thesis on what you wanted to create for your portfolio? Yeah, what I really wanted out of my bonds, I really wanted something that actually went up when the stocks went down. And so that's what I was looking for. I thought that tips would do that and that was wrong. Um and it it, it didn't work out that way. So I wasn't interested in the income at all. I really wasn't so much interested in in the stability or volatility. What I really wanted was something that spiked. It went up when the stocks went down. And there's basically one kind of bond that does that, and it's long-term treasuries. Um, and that's what it does. That's what it did in 2008. That's what it's doing now. So those funds... Uh, that I hold there are up 22% and 30% year to date. While the stock market's going down, they're going up. So you end up balancing it out. Because what I was looking for and thinking about is, what is my overall portfolio going to look like? And how can I dampen overall the volatility? And the way you do that is by your overall diversification of a portfolio. So what I learned from Ray Dalio is you probably want to have at least five things in your portfolio that he calls that the holy grail investing, having five uncorrelated asset classes in your portfolio, at least five. 
and he gets like 15. So we're talking about some stocks, some kind of bonds, some REITs or real estate, uh, some cash. And then there's a whole bunch of other things you could put in there. You can put some gold or precious metals. You can put in um, preferred stocks. You can put in maybe you have some of these other alternative investments in in uh, lending platforms or uh, P2P platforms or or other things. But those are just small components. But the idea was let's have a, a group of things that uh, as a group perform pretty well and are much less volatile. And my goal was to make my portfolio about half as volatile as a total stock market portfolio with only giving up one or 2% um, in terms of the expected returns over time. And so that was what I was trying to create. And the way these bonds played in this portfolio was I needed that thing that was going to go up when the stock market went down. I was looking for max diversification for my bonds. And that was the purpose that I had for my bonds. I didn't care about the income. I didn't care about stability in that case. So Frank, these long-term treasuries. So I, I'm really interested just in some more flavor, just generally. So I'm going to ask like a whole bunch of questions, but just yeah. kind of wind it, wind it into one answer kind of. So I guess, how do you buy these long-term treasuries? Is this like through the government directly? Are you going through a, a normal platform? Are, you know, you said they spiked 20 some odd percent in this, you know, crazy downturn. Is that because of what we talked about a couple of minutes ago where the prevailing interest rates went down in the current market? So there's a premium for these things. Like, is, is that what we're thinking about? And also like what type of interest, I know you said you weren't doing it for the interest, but what type of interest were you getting on these long-term treasuries? So I, I use funds for this. The most common fund is called TLT. It's, a, it's an ETF. There are also long-term treasury mutual funds, but TLT is it's one of the most widely traded funds in the whole world. Um, and so it's, it's very liquid and it's easy to get good prices on it. The other fund that I use is a Vanguard product called EDV, Extended Duration Value. And it basically is TLT on steroids. Um, <laughs> it's the way it works. It, it's about uh, one and a half times as uh, volatile, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a very inexpensive product for what it is. It's not as liquid as TLT, but it works fine for that. Now, the interest rates on these things were not, are not significant. I mean, when I was buying them, it was about, you know, 3%. The capital appreciation is extraordinary um, when they move. And the reason is, if you think of the duration of a bond like a lever, the longer that lever is, the more that thing is going to move when the interest rates move. So for these kinds of funds, if the interest rate goes down, the public interest rate you're always reading about, if it goes down 1%, these tend to go up about 25 to 30% in capital appreciation. It works the other way too. So they can go down a lot if the interest rate spikes, which is why you don't want to, you don't want to load up your portfolio too much with too many of these things because they're volatile. And, and, uh, uh, while everybody's, you know, loving life, um, you might not be liking life so much if the interest rates are rising, even if your stocks are going up and you have too many of these things and they're going down. So a little goes a long way for these sorts of things. So, uh, in terms of how much do I have in my portfolio of these, these sorts of things, it's around 25%. Um, I wouldn't recommend more. Right now, it's up to around 35% because they've appreciated so much. I'm going to be rebalancing out of them. But that's that's sort of how the role that they play. Um, and I feel like I didn't answer part of your no, question. No, so. you, no, you <laughs> answered everything. I, uh, so what's interesting, before you said that you have bonds to, they lower your volatility and lower the return slightly. But just a minute ago, you said these particular bonds are highly volatile. But I think what you were saying before, and I just want to clarify from my own understanding of this, is it lowers the overall volatility on your entire portfolio, right? Yes, yes. Mm. That's that's the idea. That, gotcha. that you can have things with high volatility in your portfolio if they're different and they move differently than the other things in your portfolio because that will will balance out um, and give you a lower volatility overall. And that's that's what it really means to be diversified. 
Um, right. So this is the overall, the Ray Dalio concept of having totally uncorrelated asset classes. Yeah, it's a, what he calls the risk parity type model that you may have read about in different books. This was the basis for the Tony Robbins portfolio in that book that he wrote. Um, but if you read Principles by Dalio or if you looked at other things, and there are, I've done a lot of research on this. this there are precursors to this that go back to the 1970s, uh, something called the permanent portfolio, which was invented by a guy named Harry Brown, uh, which was 25% gold, 25% long-term treasuries, 25% stocks, and 25% uh, short-term treasuries. And it worked very well in the 1970s, but uh, it had a lot of issues because uh, because things like gold are really volatile, and you don't want to have that much gold in a portfolio. It's just it's just it just ends up dominating the thing and and, and creating a, a kind of a weird weird functioning thing. But the idea that you could combine all these different asset classes has been floating around for a long time. It's only been more recently that we have free tools on the internet that you can go and experiment and see what how one of these kinds of portfolios might have performed over the past 50 years. Frank, what are the, uh, uh, what are the free tools that you can use to check out how these would have worked in past scenarios like 2008? And I guess now, I guess would be something you can look at post warnum as well. What are those free tools? Yeah, the, there's one called portfolio charts, uh, www.portfoliocharts.com. It was created by a guy named Tyler, who's an engineer a few years ago. And uh, he's designed it. So it's got about 12 uh, sample portfolios already in it, including like the Merriman portfolio, the Rick Ferry portfolio, the total stock portfolio, this, the 60-40, and, and a number of others that you've heard of. You can look and see how each one of those performs, but then you can also put in your own parameters, and it will give you everything from how did it, you know, graphs, how did it perform each year, projected safe withdrawal rates, projected for a, a period of time, for a permanent amount of time, graphs as to uh, accumulation. If you're thinking about, well, I'm going to invest in this, how is that going to look like in an accumulation phase? Um, he's very prolific with his charts, and they're all there. So, I mean, I would, uh, whoever you are, I would recommend that you go and take your portfolio in there and and plug the numbers in and see what it what it would have done for the past 50 years or since 1970. So the limitation on that tool is that it is by asset classes. So you can't put in a particular fund in there and see what it is. You, But he does tell you that, for instance, he's using um, the Vanguard total market fund for the uh, total market box in his charts there. Um, the other tool that is very useful is called Portfolio Visualizer. And that also has a whole raft of calculators and all sorts of things that run Monte Carlo simulations and do asset correlations. And, and in that one, you can put in specific stocks, funds, whatever they are, into a, a matrix and generate these sorts of things and, and analyze things like safe withdrawal rates. And, and uh, one of the more important tools in Portfolio Visualizer is actually the asset correlation tool. Uh, if you go to www.portfoliovisualizer.com, it's over on the right. What that tells you is you can go in there and put in your different funds or stocks, and it's a n numerical measure of diversification is what you get there. So when people talk about diversification, I think we we often talk about it very too loosely. It's not a narrative or a, um, a, uh, or, or a, a different naming of things. But you actually want to put a number on it so that you know how much diversified is this thing from that other thing. Because if you want a diversified portfolio, you don't want them having them all close to one. It's measured from negative one, uh, which is completely like go, goes the opposite way to positive one, which is goes the same way. So uh, I did go through in preparation for this call a bunch of common funds and what their correlations were to the, the, the total stock market. Go fund. for it. Yeah. Uh, just so just so you can get a, a feel for how different bonds are. Different bonds do different things. So from the most correlated kinds of bonds are with um, the stock market. Those would be your junk bonds. Those are bonds issued by corporations of a low credit quality. And so because they're a low credit quality, they pay high interest, relatively high interest. 
And those are the kind of bonds somebody would buy if they were only interested in the income. Uh, they just wanted the income from the bonds. Those are highly correlated with the stock market. About It's a 0.85 correlation with one being the highest. So year to date, the fund JNK, which is, holds these kind of bonds, is down 13% because they lost value along with the stock market uh, in, in capital uh, uh, And also a company with a poor credit rating, even in good times, when times are really bad, they're going to be hurting as well. And that's going to be reflected in that bond price. That's, that's the risk. Yes, it, it, it takes the risk on it. And then if you look at higher quality corporates like VTC, which is a Vanguard total corporate bond fund, or a VCLT, which is a Vanguard corporate long-term bonds fund, those are have correlation coefficients of 0.46 and 0.41. So they move when the stock market goes one way, they tend to go the same way about half that much. And so they are down 1.77% uh, and 3.44% uh, this year, year to date. And that that's an example of a slightly less correlated fund. Then you can look at something like, um, and we'll just keep going down the list, uh, if you invested in municipal bonds, a uh, fund like VTEB, and that's a Vanguard product, it invests in municipal bond funds. That has a correlation with VTI, the total stock market fund, of 0 0.24, positive 0 0.24. And so it is down 1.17% year to date. Then we get to tips, which are getting close to the zero bound. So which that's is your, also that's your worth, treasuries, right? Tips yeah. are These are a specific kind of treasury called a treasury inflation protected security. And they have a, an inflation component built into them. So they're not the regular treasuries. They are, are these inflation protected ones. So those are have a correlation coefficient to VTI of, of 0 0.19. And they're actually up. 3.83% this year, probably because they're treasury bonds and they have a, a mixed durations. And then we start getting to the things that are totally treasuries that are that have negative correlations with uh, the stock market. There is a short-term bond fund called SHY that is one to three year treasuries, essentially. It's very stable. Um, it doesn't move around a whole lot. It's up uh, 2.69% uh, in valuation this year, and, and it has a, a negative correlation of uh, 0 0.5. So it, it it will tend to go up when the stock market goes down, but it's not going to go up very much because of its very short duration. On the other hand, it's never going to go down very much. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, that is like the, uh, the CD or the uh, high yield savings account of the bond world, SHY. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting into these, these long-term funds that I mentioned before. So TLT, uh, long-term treasury bonds of a average duration of 20 years. It has a negative correlation with the stock market of uh, negative 0 0.47 on the negative one to one scale. It is up year to date, 22%. And then we have EDV, which is this even longer duration product. Um, it tries to capture more of a 25 to 30 year duration. And that fund is uh, negatively correlated, uh, again, around negative 0 0.5, and it has gone up 30% in this environment. So just going through that list, you can see bonds are way more diversified <laughs> than, than stocks are. If you went and put a whole, whole bunch of stock funds in there, they're all going to be like between 0 0.6 and 0 0.99 correlated with the rest of the stock market. Right, um, and right. as they, as they say, in, in bad environments, the correlation goes to one, and they all go down together, and and basically you see that's what what happened, which is typical. So, if you're really looking at trying to diversify your portfolio, and, and I, Rick Ferry made a really good point in your prior podcast that getting a bunch of different stock funds that's really not diversifying a portfolio. You have to have completely different asset classes whether they're you know bonds or gold or REITs or some other other thing that performs differently uh, just as a as in the normal course that's where you're really going to get your diversification uh, out of your portfolio right and I want to look at the other the other half of this I think it's important for context like right now someone's like wow long-term treasuries up 22 percent I should probably go all in on long-term treasuries 
You know? no. Right, no, right? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I was saying if someone had this exact thought when the market had crashed in 2009, they watched their portfolio and they look at long-term treasuries and they see, wow, they're up, you know, and they had been all in on long-term treasuries, they would have had a really painful last, you know, 10 or 12 years. Like the time to be buying long-term treasuries is, and I want you to clarify this, but I, but I, it's my understanding, the time to buy long-term treasuries is not after the market has crashed and long-term treasuries have gone up 22%. That's not going to be a wise financial move. I mean, I think this goes to a broader idea that's a basic portfolio management. Um, and I think you were talking about your um, portfolio policy statement. policy statement. Yeah, yeah, that you never want to change horses and go from one portfolio setup to another one when your current one is doing badly, because what you will be doing is essentially selling low and buying high. What you want to do is you decided you had that portfolio. You may not like it now, but the best thing to do is think about what kind of portfolio you eventually want to have. Keep riding the one you have. Wait till it gets back near the highs. You know, it's, you know, uh, it's within 5 10%. And, th- and that's the point in time that you make these these kind of switches. It's it's so counterintuitive that the time you're supposed to change your portfolio when, is when there's nothing wrong with your portfolio. <laughs> 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 because and, and the reason you change it is because your plans have changed, or you know you're coming to uh, to a place where maybe you're not going to be putting in money anymore, and you want something that is going to be a drawdown portfolio and not an accumulation portfolio. Or, or you just have other reasons. But one of my biggest financial mistakes from 2008 was jumping around and fiddling around with various portfolios for, you know, four or five years. Um, and so I got caught, for instance, having too much gold when the gold price collapsed in uh, 2011 or 12. And it was because I got too excited about it and it was going up. And, and I learned a lesson there that, no, that's not good portfolio management. So the other, the other thing, treasuries have been going, they go up and down uh, as the interest rates cycle. And since they are about half as volatile typically as the stock market, there's been many rebalancing opportunities for these sorts of things. So I can recall in my 401k, I remember five, six years ago, these treasuries just, they die, they went down like 30% in a year. And so I bought EDV at like 88 EDV is not at 170. So by rebalancing into it when it was doing badly, it really helps your portfolio. It's just you have to have the the stomach to watch the thing go down and then buy it when it's low by selling the things that are doing well. And that's that's basically how you manage a portfolio to sell high and buy low as opposed to the, the other way. So Frank, just kind of in summary here, I want to just hear your thoughts generally on on this portfolio management. So, you know, obviously you're saying this is an example, right, where you had gold and you got excited and you bought more, but at the time you thought that was a wise decision, right? Which it, it's easy to look back in hindsight and say it wasn't, but now that you've had the benefit of being through something like that, and you've read all these these books by Ray Dalio, and, and he's talked about the 15 different asset classes. Frankly, I don't know if I could think of 15 if you gave me five hours to think about that. Like, how does someone contemplate what are even the different options? How does someone contemplate, okay, maybe you don't want 25% in gold, maybe you want 4% in gold. Like, are there ways to model this out? Like, how would you advise someone who's listening to this and has been fascinated? Like, how do they move forward from this end of this podcast? Yeah, I think the best place to study portfolios would be to go to portfolio charts um, and look at that there there are like, I said 12, I think there are maybe 18 different portfolios there, uh, many which include some of these sorts of things. And and you can see the ones that have things like REITs and gold in them and what they did, and then modify that and play around with it a little bit. Where I ended up, for instance, you know, I'll just tell you what my kind of drawdown portfolio looks like. Uh, it's about 42 to 45% stocks, 25, 26% these long-term treasury bonds, 10 to 16% gold. And then most of the rest of it is an assortment of REITs and, and uh, a few other things like preferred stocks and other just small portions of, of various things. 
Rick Ferry thought of the, the portfolio as a cake. I think of mine as more of an orchestra. And when you get down to these little things, you're talking about the marimbas and timpanis and things in the back. <laughs> Do you love the marimbas? Special place for those. <laughs> And, and that's where that's where you could also put in your 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 experimental things or you know uh, if you look at somebody like um, uh, David Stein of Money for the Rest of Us, he has fifteen different asset classes in his portfolio, <laughs> and some of them are you know private lending to real estate projects and all sorts of other things like that that I wouldn't understand. He's invested in art and, and other things like that. Um, so. That's a little bit beyond me, but uh, you can construct one of these things with with uh, just a few funds um, if you really want to. And the uh, what I've also found is that this kind of a portfolio is also appropriate for medium term investing. And I'll give you an, an example of that. My my eldest son um, lives in Charlottesville, and he graduated from UVA, and he works there. Um, and so, as far as his long term stuff is concerned, I said just put it in a total stock market thing and leave it alone and you know, look at it in 10 years and we'll figure that out. But he also wanted to save money to buy a house in a few years. And so I said, well, you could take that money and put it in one of these sort of portfolios that looks like you were retiring. Um, so mm. <laughs> and so we put him in, in something like that. And it, it does have half of the volatility of the stock market. And so it does tend to grow uh, and not have these gigantic declines. And so he saved the money for the house. And then last year he bought the, uh, he, he cashed in a bunch of that and put the down payment on the house. And and now he's got uh, his friends renting from him in rooms. Nice. <laughs> nice. nice. So, <laughs> love it. I could, I, I could not get him to read A Simple Path of Wealth, but w- once he got Scott Trench's book, uh, <laughs> he was all over that. It was it's just interesting what, what appeals to different That's people. Amazing. Yeah, so, so Scott Trench's book, but, Set for Life, that is a fantastic manual yeah. for anybody that's just getting started on their financial journey. Love that book. So um, so just kind of a long-winded way to say that there's kind of a lot of ways to skin these cats. And it, and it does depend on how much time you want to spend really looking at, at all of this stuff. But there are, if you go to the portfolio charts, uh, for instance, the... Um, the the author of that site has created something called the Golden Butterfly, which is one of these kinds of portfolios. And you can look and see how that performed. And he also has a recent a blog post there looking at all the different portfolios on the site and seeing how they performed during this financial crisis. So you can see the difference of, of how they, they went along and then look at each one. But I think you'll get a nice perspective as to that there's more out there besides stocks and bonds. And there are good reasons why you might want to have a few of those things. You don't need to overload yourself, but those things will help you smooth out your portfolio and will give you higher protected safe withdrawal rates than your standard stock bond combinations. Yeah, Frank, that that's great. I just wanted to, I wanted to just get your thoughts on something real quick. So going back to kind of one of your initial setups for this, you know, the three reasons uh, for bonds are stability income or diversification, maybe, maybe all of the above or some combination thereof. But those are the three different reasons you would want to hold bonds. And I'm just curious for someone now that has like a a very simple portfolio and allocation of, you know, just for, for this hypothetical example, they're just, they just have a two fund strategy. They have VTI, the total stock market, and they have BND, the Vanguard total bond index fund. They've just come through the last couple months and and the BND fund, I mean, you saw the volatility right there around March 12th for a couple of days, but it quickly kind of got back to a pretty steady number and it seems to be holding the line. In your mind, looking at that, did that accomplish the stability goal to a satisfactory amount? Did that smooth the ride for an individual or um, is that a failed thesis? Yeah, I, I think it, it, the thing about the BND is it, it does satisfy the, these uh, qualifications, but it doesn't do any one of them particularly well. So if you really wanted just stability, you would probably want to look at something like SHY, which we talked about, which is that short-term bond fund. Um, And if you look at the volatility of that, you're going to see it's pretty darn flat. And the performance has been almost like BND this year, but it is more stable. If you wanted uh, income, you would buy something like JNK. Um, and you take that income, but you'd also take that risk that you're going to see 
the the thing go down. Now it's probably going to go back up eventually, and you'll still, in the meantime, you'll still be getting the same income from it, assuming that you know the companies in there don't all go belly up. But they, they probably won't if they're uh, there's a lot of them. But that will be a volatile thing that will produce income. And then if you're truly interested in only diversification, you don't the, the kinds of things that I own. So you can see that the BND does some of all of those things, but it doesn't do any one of them as well as something else would. Awesome. All right, Frank, this has been fantastic. I've kind of, I've appreciate, I really, I wanted the opportunity to pick your brain. I legitimately think I, I've been saving it forever. It's an ask Frank segment. I want to continue <laughs> to bring you back on to answer a couple of these, but people are listening. They want to maybe follow up with you or continue these conversations. I know you're super generous with your time and you love having these types of conversations. So how can people connect with you? Yeah, the Facebook group is probably the easiest place to do that. I'm there pretty frequently, and particularly these days, there's <laughs> you can only go for so many walks before you come back and <laughs> look at what's online. I think I'll take another. Yeah. So that that I, I think that's the that that's the easiest place to contact me. Frank, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. You're quite welcome. To our audience, I hope you got value from this. I know this added a layer of complexity into the calculus here. And and I think you're ready for that. You know, I don't don't mean that it's not condescending. It's just saying like simplicity is our foundation for life. You need to have confidence in your plan. And as you start seeing, wow, my plan is working. You can start slowly dabbling with some more, you know, complicated tools, nothing overwhelming, but just, Hey, am I happy with stability? Like B and D worked fine. If I just wanted to do a 60, 40 stocks to bonds, then B and D held the line. My stocks went down to some varying degree and I'm comfortable with that rebalancing. That is fine. Totally adequate. If you're interested in saying, oh, wow, bonds actually represent these financial tools. They represent debt either by the government or by the companies or by local municipalities. They represent all these different things. And maybe I'd like to experiment inside of my bonds I'd like to experiment with some of these more nuanced tools. What I would recommend you do is do that as part of your asset allocation. Please don't start chasing returns because of what you heard on this show. You're going to end up buying high and selling low. You're going to be fiddling with your plan and never happy with the results. But if instead you want to start crafting your plan, building your asset allocation and doing it in a way where you you want to fight that urge to chase returns, then consider taking a look at M1 Finance. Now, this is what I use for my own asset allocation. This is what keeps me from chasing returns. Instead, it gets me focused on following the plan. What's great about M1 Finance is you actually can use all of the ETFs. You can find all the ETFs that we mentioned on this platform. You can purchase everything that was mentioned, including the total stock market index fund, the total bond index fund. If you want to go get a little bit more diversified and use some of these others, all of them are available inside this platform, completely commission-free. For a full review and more information, go to choosefi.com slash M1. All right, my friends, thanks for joining us. Hope you got value from today's episode. Please subscribe and share with a friend if you did, and we'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. All right, as promised, here are the updates that the SBA released about the Paycheck Protection Program for those applying for stimulus money. Hi, Brad and Jonathan. Sean Mullaney calling in about an important update for self-employed individuals regarding the Paycheck Protection Program, often referred to as the PPP program. This is the program where you can get a loan to cover eight weeks worth of payroll expenses And there's been a lot of questions about, well, wait a minute, how does this apply to a self-employed individual? The loan forgiveness amount is generally based on compensation. For W-2 workers, that's relatively simple. But for self-employed individuals, compensation is generally equal to self-employed profit. And how are you going to have profit when we have an economic shutdown, perhaps for the entirety of the next eight weeks? Well, the SBA came out with some regulations today, April 14th. Very good news for self-employed individuals, for independent contractors, 1099 workers. What they are saying is you need to look at your 2019 Schedule C. That's the schedule you use to report your self-employed income. And you take the net profit off that form from 2019 and you take 8 divided by 52, that fraction, and multiply it by your 2019 self-employed income, 
and you get what your loan could be and the forgiveness of the uh, the loan could be. So this is really good news. It means that our self-employed individuals are going to be able to get PPP loans forgiven even without net income in 2020. A uh, few points on this. One, Schedule C. You might be thinking, well, wait a minute. Didn't they just extend the federal return filing deadline to July 15th? I haven't done my tax return. I don't have a Schedule C. What they're saying in these new regulations is prepare a Schedule C for purposes of the loan documentation, even if you've yet to file your tax return. So I would tell you, if you haven't filed your tax return for 2019 yet, focus right now on that Schedule C, get it in good working order. It doesn't have to be filed. It just has to be prepared and ready in paper to give to your banker, right? So that's a big point here is get that Schedule C done as soon as possible, the regs also have some language saying if you were not self-employed in 2019, but you were by February 15, 2020, they're going to come out with some rules on that. So stay tuned on that if you're just new to the self-employment world at the beginning of 2020. Last point, they say that partnerships, not partners, will file for PPP loans. That's an important clarification. A lot going on here. But really good news for those who are 1099 workers, independent contractors, the self-employed in the audience, you will be able to get a PPP loan. You may need to hurry and get a good Schedule C prepared quickly. Hope everyone is well and hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. All right, everyone. Hope that helps. Again, you can find Sean Mullaney, the Fi Tax Guy at FiTaxGuy.com. And we'll see you next time.